Welcome to Heads Up Ophthalmology. In this talk, we're going to cover applying for ophthalmology, the steps involved in the process, and what you can do to give yourself the best chance of getting an offer for ophthalmology training. My name is Ashwin Venkatesh, and I'm an offer holder for ophthalmology training in seven deanery. This encompasses Bristol, Bath, Gloucestershire, and Swindon, and I'm looking forward to getting started this August. If you have any further questions following this video or would like to discuss anything ophthalmology related, I'm happy to be contacted via LinkedIn. Make a Medic also have a great website with plenty of other resources that are worth checking out. Let's start with an overview of some of the factors you should consider when deciding upon a career in ophthalmology. From the pro's perspective, you will rarely find an unhappy ophthalmologist. Unanimously, there is a great sense of satisfaction from being able to restore vision for patients and assist them with managing life-limiting illnesses. Ophthalmology is known as a cradle-to-grave specialty where you can impact patients of all ages and form longer-lasting patient-doctor relationships. Moreover, with the shift in population and disease demographic, there is a growing shortfall in ophthalmology consultants, so your career is largely future-proofed. Also, if you find that you enjoy medicine and surgery, perhaps ophthalmology might be for you as many conditions can be medically managed or are a consequence of systemic illness, and that requires a broad range of knowledge. Equally, the surgery undertaken is hugely rewarding, as it requires meticulously developing dexterity to achieve precision microsurgery, and even a short procedure can have a massive impact. Fortunately, there are excellent simulation technologies and skills courses that are widely available for trainees to hone this high-stakes craft. In addition, training is run through, and there is now a possibility of achieving CCT in just five and a half years, meaning there is no further interview process required to complete your specialty training. All things considered, ophthalmology is perceived to have a good work-life balance relative to other specialties, and there are also many exciting avenues to explore, including academic research, maybe drug development for pharmaceutical companies, or innovations in medical technology, along with humanitarian efforts abroad to aid underserved populations. As for the cons, I did have to think long and hard, but here are a few that uh, is generally considered to be some of the downsides of ophthalmology. The first is uh, the intense caseload and high turnover. Ophthalmology has the highest outpatient volume for a given specialty in the NHS, and this is palpable when you're in clinical practice. Moreover, it is very difficult at the point of entry due to intense competition and the requirement to excel in a demanding portfolio, MSRA and interview selection process. Lastly, op opportunities for cataract surgery during training can be variable as more straightforward cataracts are often getting outsourced to the private sector. However, the Royal College has been working on improving access to these training opportunities. So here is a brief overview of the training programme. After completing the foundation program, you can apply straight for ophthalmology run through training. The specialty training program has just been overhauled and this new curriculum is hot off the press to commence in 2024. The fundamental change in the structure of training is a move from a years of experience based model to a levels of competence based model and the rough equivalents are shown in the diagram above. There are seven years to complete CCT and progress will be assessed at the end of each of the four levels. Levels one and two are really about broad-based competencies or basic skills to manage low complexity patients across all the subspecialty areas. So what does this look like in practice? Essentially, level one completion requires level one competencies and the part one exam to be completed, and there are two years to complete level one. Level two requires level two competencies and the refraction certificate and this is considered to take about one year to complete. After a maximum of three years, therefore, trainees progress to level three, where they gain special interest competencies to perform at the level of a comprehensive general ophthalmologist in all special interest areas. This should be finished by five and a half years at most, including completion of the part two exam. Trainees then move on to level four, which is the equivalent of fellowship training, and this has now been incorporated within the training program. Trainees are therefore expected to achieve fellowship level training in two special interest areas or SIAs as part of their training program. An example would be complex cataract and cornea or vitreoretinal or plastics. After completion of the training program, here are the many possible subspecialist areas to pursue as a consultant ophthalmologist. 
trainees may also wish to pursue further fellowships, perhaps abroad or at a different centre, to broaden their experience further. So this is an overview of the application process as it stands for the 2023 application cycle. Back in November, we were required to fill an application form and ORIEL that concerned our background details, but it's worth bearing in mind that there are no white space questions or any particular points to be considered at this stage. Then in January, we had the MSRA exam, and this is worth about 20% of the application and crucially is used for shortlisting for the interviews, so you have to meet a basic cutoff score. This was followed by portfolio evidence submission in February, and that's worth 50%. And then in March, we had the interview, which was worth about 30%. We then found out our results in April. The competition ratio in the previous cycle was about nine to one places, and this has been on an upward trajectory. And in my year, there was over 10 to one in terms of applicants to number of offered places. The MSRA is the multi-specialty recruitment assessment, and this is now being employed for selection in the vast majority of specialties. You can apply for any number of these specialties, and your score will be the same across them. However, it's worth noting that your weighted score will be relative to others who applied for that particular specialty. For instance, let's say you scored 600. In ophthalmology, that might give you a weighted score of 13 out of 20 relative to those who had applied for ophthalmology. But another specialty your 600 may give you a higher or lower weighted score depending on the score distribution of the candidates who applied for that particular specialty. There are two components to the MSRA. The first is the professional dilemmas section, which is effectively like the SJT that you did uh, when in med school. Here you have to rank options according to how appropriate they are to a given scenario. These 50 scenarios are worth 50% of your total score for the MSRA. The next is a clinical problem solving component, which is essentially like finals SBA questions with a focus on primary care presentations. Here there are 97 questions, again worth 50% of your MSRA score. So in terms of the interview, the interview for ophthalmology in my cycle was the third cycle to run in this new virtual format over Microsoft Teams. This involved a 10 minute communication skills station where you're presented with a scenario such as a cancelled operation or perhaps breaking bad news of a life-limiting diagnosis or breaking bad news of disease progression. And you're scored upon the above criteria during your virtual consultation. The trick is to not get bogged down too much with detail, but instead show that you're attentive to the patient's concerns and explore these in full detail, remaining honest, empathetic and proactive throughout to help them to the best of your abilities. I would strongly recommend working with friends to practice running through possible scenarios so that you are slick and prepared when the time comes. So in terms of what you can do now, it is worth looking at the portfolio scoring requirements well in advance to get ahead, as there are a lot of points on offer and many aspects to accomplish. But let me stress that you do not need to achieve all of what I've listed to achieve an excellent score in the portfolio. So the first section is commitment to specialty, and this is where the lion's share of points lie. So points are awarded here for publishing non-peer-reviewed articles or case reports, completing electives or undergraduate projects, uh, attending a taster week, and attending also in your free time over 10 sessions in the eye department. Completion of greater than four hours on the IC simulator is recognized alongside attending simulation training courses and ophthalmology meetings. There's also a discretionary point for those who go in above and beyond, uh, for instance, doing things like charity work. Completion of the refraction certificate and part one exam also gets you points, which is great if you have the time, but is by no means necessary to do well on the application. The next section is for prizes and can include being awarded best presentation or poster at a research meeting, a research grant, achieving a first class and finals, achieving a national undergraduate prize, for instance, top 10% in the Duke Elder examination. And if you happen to score to achieve the top score on the part one exam, that gets you the Crombie medal and that also is rewarded points. The next section is for qualifications. And for those who have a prior MSc or BSc or MD, PhD, then they get points. However, for those who have entered medicine as their first degree, then unfortunately intercalated degrees do not count for points. So, here are the other sections. To maximize on these, try and get a couple of publications as first author, 
a QI or audit that is published or implemented widely and try to present your work widely. To do this in the most time efficient way, aim for a few international oral presentations as first author as this gives you the greatest weighting of points. However, you can also achieve the same number of points through various combinations of regional, national, international presentations as in a poster or oral format. So essentially, try and seize whatever opportunities come your way. Lastly, education and teaching contributions are scored for developing a course or e-learning tool, attending a formal Teach the Teachers course, examining undergraduates, for example in OSCEs, writing a textbook chapter or a book, or completing a higher teaching qualification. Remember, for many of these sections, it does not have to be ophthalmology specific. So you can use a publication or audit that you did on general surgery, for example. I would also recommend trying to find helpful consultants and trainees who can springboard you in the right direction. I know all of this might seem endless and overwhelming right now, but by giving yourself plenty of time and breaking down these requirements into smaller steps, I'm sure you'll be well on your way to achieving success in the application process. So I really do hope this was helpful as a primer for approaching the ophthalmology applications. Remember to take a look at the Make a Medic website and of course the official advice from the Royal College of Ophthalmology and Seven Deanery websites to gain further information on the application process. I wish you all the best in your upcoming applications.